Welcome to the Entrepreneur Next Door. This is Zev Ash. I'm going to use a little soundtrack before I say anything. Hold on. Here we go. Okay, so <laughs> this is this is the intro to my guest, Ernie Harker. Welcome. Uh, this podcast is not sponsored by uh, Red Bull because Ernie is going to give us enough energy to last more than the five-hour little thing you buy in a 7-Eleven. Uh, Ernie, welcome. One Zero, minute. Thank so, you. One minute or so. Tell us who you are. Oh, my gosh. I'm a, I'm a sufferer of hyperactive productivity disorder. Okay, that's not like a clinical diagnosis, but that is exactly who I am. I am like nonstop. I hate wasting time. I hate... Uh, um, uh, I want to go right to the heart of anything. And I, I'm, I'm highly interested in people. But my back, my professional background is I've been a branding expert. I am a creative professional who helps organizations and individuals develop like really cool brands that get attention and that the owners of those brands can get excited about. Perfect. Now, by the way, this, this, um, uh, you have a, uh, you have a twin, identical I twin do. brother. I do. And I now watch your your photos. You, you guys are well. I guess identical means yeah. You're identical. Yeah. Um, unlike you, he is a a family marriage con therapist coach. Yes, that's right. That's is right. he a therapist? Is like he's, he's a therapist. Like a he's a licensed marriage and family therapist, and he's very good, very successful. So, so the the diagnosis you started with was that courtesy of your twin brother, or did you just make the stuff up? We we have the same we have the same problem. It's like ADD, but instead of being ADD that's distracted with whimsical things, like time wasting things, we are not video game players. We are not uh, series TV watchers. We are if we have time, we will we are working on things that will promote and develop ourselves or our businesses. Like we are athletes. We train hard. Um, we are not couch potatoes. Uh, we, it's very challenging. Like, for example, you, you're talking about, you, right before the show, you were telling me about uh, getting on a Peloton, mm -hmm. kind of energized, right? Yep. My, my hyperactive productivity disorder is so bad that if I want to spend an hour spinning, which I do occasionally, I want to watch something that's going to entertain me and inform me. And I'll spend 30 minutes looking for the right content that's a, that's deserving of my time because I don't want to waste a second. But in the meantime, I just spent 30 minutes looking for a video. That's how messed up I am. So so I, I know it's not you, but you're like the guy, the guys that go to the gym and then drive 20 minutes until there's a parking spot open right in front of the front door. No, 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 I no, 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 I'm kidding. I was kidding. I know, I was kidding. <laughs> so, but look, you know, it's interesting because, because, we, I think we all have some forms of ADD or ADHD, yeah. but if you channel it correctly, like you're doing it, yeah, right. Instead of allowing you to just let it let it drag you into the black hole of attention deficit mm -hmm. and and go aimlessly in different directions, you can rechannel it towards. Okay, now I'm focused on. I need to find the right video. Yeah, um, yeah. I do that sometimes, Ernie. Honestly, what if if I don't want to do some with Ali Love or some of the, my my other favorite instructors, I'll go on a YouTube channel and look for something educational. Like I'm into this photo AI editing and, and video editing with AI, but then I feel like I'm cheating because it's not the same. I'll get lost in, in the content mm -hmm. instead of working out. So before yeah. I dive into, I have a question yeah. to ask you. I know it's, it's yeah. really, it's really cheesy, but you know, identical twins, there's always stories about them because you guys look re really alike. Yeah. I mean, can yeah. people tell the difference? People that doesn't know you, they don't know you. Can they if tell they don't the know us, well, here's the thing. When um he typically wears a short beard, and I am usually clean shaven. And right, uh, so that's so, a there's a that's purpose for that. That's help identify who we are. But also as a licensed marriage and family therapist, there is a um there's almost a gravitas. Mm -hmm. There is like if you if you have a beard and it's got silver in that beard. You have maturity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There is a level of sophistication, um, wisdom, you know, that is part of the packaging of a personal brand. And so yeah. he's, he's acquired that, or he's let his beard grow because 
He wants to look the part to instill confidence in his audience. Um, right, so the me, the I want to be youthful and energetic and stuff. And so I'm like, dude, I don't want to see anybody to see the gray in my beard. So so the reason I bring it up is for, it's, I'm, I'm not being really cheesy like those shows, Extras and TMZ. Uh -huh. Can you share something like really cookie the two of you did where you swap roles? I mean, the dating thing, it's been beat oh, up, you, right? Where the yeah. twins, one guy dated somebody and then they swapped and oh my gosh. couldn't tell. What I, it doesn't yeah. have to be, but anything like that I'm was so like so. Um, there's two occasions. One, so when I was going to middle school, he and I had the same teachers for um, math and history. I had a uh, the math my math teacher first, and a history teacher second, and his was reversed. Okay, so my brother was sick that day. And um, the two co the two math teachers or the two teachers were really good friends because they were coaches uh, on the football team. Mm -hmm. And I was at my second class, my history class, which which uh, the math teacher was in there. I had not got to my my math class yet because uh, mine was next. But this teacher looked at me. He thought I was my brother, and he goes, "The nerve, the nerve you have coming to his class, and you skipped mine." Like he was mad and I was scared. And I looked at him, I say, uh, Mr. Gardner, I have you next period. He turned and <laughs> walked away. I mean, that, but we also did like, uh, we did a dating thing once. I was, I was dating a girl and uh, not for very long. We had just started hanging out. And um, uh, I think she liked me a little more than I liked her. And so I was like, not too into it. But we went to a dance club and up ahead in the line, I saw my brother with a bunch of his, our mutual friends. And I said, so I said, hey, excuse me, I'm going to go talk to my brother. So I went and, and talked to him. I says, when you get in, go to the bathroom and we're going to switch clothes. I want you to da dance with my date. So, so we did. And I'm, dan I'm like hanging out and dancing with our mutual friends. In the meantime, he's dancing with a complete stranger. He has no idea who this is. Three songs later or so, he's getting uncomfortable. And because she's like doing the woo-woo eyes and like getting close and stuff. He's like, I have no idea who this girl is. So I could see him leaning in close to whisper to her. And then she snapped her head, laser focused eyeballs on me and bolted for the door. And I'm like, oh, crap. That didn't turn out the way I wanted to. And I found her by the, uh, I found her outside and she's, she's crying. And I, and she says, I should have known the difference. I should have known the difference. And I was like, look, my mom doesn't know the difference sometimes. So, so please don't. And that was, that was mean of me to do, but that, yeah, it kind that, of backfired. That's a 50, 50 gamble. Cause you, you'd have, yeah. you'll have the women that would react like her. Mm -hmm. uh, and then will be the other one to say, Oh wow, this is really cool, and it's, yeah. it becomes a challenge. All right, so <laughs> so um, I'm gonna jump in the time machine, dial back. Yeah, you're a teenager, you're dating, you're swapping with your brother, you're doing exciting <laughs> stuff. I run into you at, at a football game, and I say, Ernie, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, what Disney animator, be? Disney Anime. animator, no question about it. I wanted to work for Disney. Like, um, I was so in love with the Walt Disney brand. And the Walt Disney productions, the movie productions. Um, I was, I had a really, really good uh, middle school art teacher that recognized my potential and invited me to stay after school and be part of an art club. And where I really kind of pushed, where he really influenced me to to invest in illustration. And when, uh, as a kid, you get, so I was the middle child of nine boys, no sisters. Okay, wow. when you're when you're in an ocean of brothers, the older brothers are getting in trouble and the younger kids need lots of attention. You're kind of off, you know, you, you don't get a lot of attention. So when people say, oh my gosh, Ernie, your art is so good. Oh my gosh, that was like heroin. I wanted more of that. And so I invested a tremendous amount of energy and time into drawing. In fact, my mom carried out her threat one day of 
throwing out what she called the idiot box. Do you know what that is, Zev? What do you think the idiot box is? Idiot box, I think, used to be called a TV, wasn't it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because it turned us all into idiots. So yeah. mom put the T, mom had dad put the TV in the garage for two years when I was a uh, 13, 14 years old. And I used that time to really focus on my, my passion for art, my hobby for art. And it, 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 um, catapulted my skill level because of the amount of time I spent doing it into a completely different league from like, so I got lots of attention in middle school and high school for being an artist. And that helped me to get a career that started in illustration. So, so you were born with some innate skills. Mm -hmm. I mean, you ask me to draw anything, it will be laughable, but you, uh -huh. I think you, you have to be born with something in the DNA shuffle that allows you to pick it up and then you hone your skills through yeah. teachers discovers you, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but, I mean, you guys are big guys. You you played football. Well, uh, I wasn't big I, as a kid. I was tiny. Oh, I was tiny. like, yeah, yeah. I was tiny. I was like seventy two pounds in seventh grade, eighty four pounds in eighth grade. Like I remember the weight because that's what I wrestled. Because that's like the football coach would never let me play because he was afraid I'd be like crushed. And so I was always an athlete as a kid, but no, I was always a hungry athlete as a kid. I wanted to be admired like the football players and the basketball players but i was a scrawny scrawny little wrestler and all the girls i liked liked the athletes the big guys i was tiny and so they looked at me like a little like a little brother and so mm. i was the cute friend instead of the romantic interest mm. and so man i wanted to be like those big guys but you could illustrate beautiful cards to the two women. Right. Right. That's Renner. right. So, home and industry. Mm -hmm. So so you actually go to school for illustration, mm -hmm. right? And then you yep. dream about working for Disney. Yep. Then you get this offer to go work for an agency, right? You yeah. never make it to Disney. Yep. Right. Uh, right. What was the attraction about working for an agency? So so what did you do at the agency? Were you illustrating inside? I was the um I, when, my first role in the agency was doing storyboards and what we called comprehensive design comp comps. And they're basically uh, pre-visualization uh, for an ad. Like the director or art director would say, hey, we need a picture of a dolphin jumping out of a computer processor and way, you know, water spraying out and we need it to, it's the Intel inside the Intel uh, Pentium processor. Um, and so you can't find stock photography like that. And by the way, this was before the internet where you could go online and find whatever you want. And yeah. so it's faster for me to just sketch it out and then marker it in, color it in mm -hmm. and show the art director. And they would scan that and drop it into an ad layout so they could show their client about, Hey, here's kind of what we're thinking. We're thinking about getting a photo photograph or a, a, a composite of this dolphin jumping out of a computer processor. But I would do many, many of these comps before a, uh, the client would agree to any one concept. So I was like fodder. I was like, I was like the frontline grunt in the army of coming up with as many creative visuals ideas and they were all getting shot down. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. but uh, it helped me get really good at what I was doing. It's interesting. It's not really what I want to talk about. Whether you're saying dolphin jumping out of a computer, <laughs> first thing, first thing that came to my mind is because I'm playing around with all these photo AI platforms mm -hmm. that are that are out there, and a few of them. I forgot the one that's always in the news now. You can actually give it instructions of say, you know, create a create an image of a dolphin jumping out of a computer, and in the background, waterfalls, mm -hmm. and, and they do it almost instantly. It's it's mind blown the stuff that yeah. comes out. But so let's go back to yeah. so you illustrate for a bunch of idiots who can't make up their minds. Uh -huh. And then I mean, our agency is I mean, you do all the creative work, but you know all the attention is always on the front guys, right? Oh, the, for sure. You know, for the, sure. The account executive. If they're the idea whatever. guys. Yeah, I'm just yeah. I'm just the production crew. There you go. So at, at some point. You you get tired of it and then what? You you start your own thing? 
Yeah, I was um, I was a storyboard artist doing a lot of like digital design and stuff for uh, this agency. And at times we would be um, pitching really big clients where there was like three or four different creative teams working on it. And I just did not have the capacity to, to, to uh, illustrate and mock up all the ideas. And so we would hire artists from Los Angeles to fly to Salt Lake City and pay them to do their work. And I'm like, these guys are making in like a week what I make in a month. So why don't I just be independent? That seems like, oh, by the way, this the agency I worked at was like a traditional madman type. A, you lived and you bled for the agency. Yeah. They paid you well, but like today's culture would never stand for this. Like it was not uncommon for you to go home at 10 or 11 o'clock at night and then get up and be there at, eight or nine in the morning. That was not uncommon. In fact, there was a standing policy that if you were going to work till eight or later, the agency would buy you dinner. And I ate dinner many, many times at the agency. They just bring in really nice dinners. And that's what you were. So that's what made me leave. I, my wife got pregnant and I knew, and we actually had uh, tickets to go to um, a flight to uh, um, Europe. I'd always wanted to do. And my boss said, look, you're going to have to, uh, we can't let you go to this. Fl-. You know, I'm like, I've been planning it for a year. This was, I was studying the language, like German language. And he was like, no, we're going to have to, we need you to stay. So we can't let you go. And I go, I can't live like this anymore. And so I said, I'm, I'm going to be gone. So, and, so, so you quit a job, a good paying mm-hmm, job yeah. when your wife is pregnant. Mm-hmm. How did she mm-hmm. feel about that? Terrified. My father-in-law told me I was an idiot. He was like, you are ridiculous. But what's crazy is I had such a great relationship with the agency that I made as much with them in the first three months as I did in the previous year with them. They just kept, because they didn't have anybody to take my place. And now I'm charging outside rates. And I, it was I was crushing it, but I was an artist running a business. Now, anybody who can see that train coming is going to say, watch out because there's a business to run and it's being done by a creative. Like what are taxes? What's insurance? What's, I I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got some in my family. My son's a, an amazingly talented jazz musician. My Mm ex-wife was a photographer Artists mm-hmm. in general are the worst business people in the yeah. world. It's, it, yep. The money piece is not. The, the, I think. I think the problem. The problem for artists. That's just my own interpretation. Is that when they begin to chase the monetary rewards, I think it affects their core belief that they are artists. Now I'm doing yeah. it for money. It, there's something that just doesn't jive, and they don't want to compromise. Yeah. The smart ones, and that's why I used to tell my son, listen. The, the job you're going to take while you're still playing is a means to an end, but he yeah. still didn't want to do it. He just said, why would I work for somebody for eight hours making $10 an hour when I could yeah. spend eight hours practicing the saxophone and write my own music? Yeah. And to As as a dad, like like your father-in-law, right? You would mm-hmm, say, mm-hmm. what, are you an idiot? You got to make, yeah. you got you know, but I understood and I had just left him alone and, and he, yeah. he did his thing. So, I was lucky. I was lucky because... um. Remember, I told you that I craved the attention that drawing and art gave me. I was not drawing for me. I was never mm-hmm. drawing for me. And a lot of creative people, they draw for themselves. They, they paint for themselves. And so I was like a, a whore. I was like, whatever you pay me to do or whatever attention you give me, I will do it. So I was a commercial artist from day one. And so I didn't have that problem as a typical artist. Uh, creative, I was like, you want to pay me to do something? Oh, I'm in. What do you want it? What What do you? I'm happy to do it for you. And then if they would say, hey, you know what? I don't like the red hat. I want you to make it blue. I didn't have any creative affection for my work. I was just craving the 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 praise, the 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 results of it. Mm-hmm. And so I'd say, okay, I'll change the color. I don't care. But a lot of creative people say, no, because the composition and the color. Uh, I'm like, nope. I don't even go there. Yeah. Which interesting. We'll get to branding in, in, in a couple yeah. of minutes. So so you start eight fish. 
Mm -hmm. What what was that? So it's the number eight and the word yep. fish. Yeah. Well, tell tell me like, quickly about the name. There were eight of us at the time. Oh, My the company brothers. was called Earnburn. No, it wasn't the brothers. None of the brothers. Oh, were all eight degree. people in the company. Yeah, eight oh. people in the company. So because I started with me, right, and then I hired another guy to help me out, and then we doubled the next year and the next year, and so about, you know, four years into this, I'm, I got eight nine people. I think eight people at the time. And I didn't want to be called Earnburn anymore because I felt that was a self-centered name. That was my nickname growing up. And um, I didn't want other people thinking, oh, I'm working for this guy. I want people to think I'm working for this company that I am a part of. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to rename the company. Um, and we, we did a whole bunch of uh, brainstorming. And we had like a little laptop where we were trying to make sure that we could get the domain name, right? We liked the idea of having a number at the beginning of our name because that would show up at the top of like a, a phone directory or whatever. The Numbers the, are always yeah. above that. The, the old, old yellow pages trick. You know, exactly. It's like, it's, everything is like <laughs> a, 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 a Ernie Byrne. Yeah, right. Like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Was, so I feel bad for the ninth guy you hired because it was eight fish. I said, what am I, chop liver? Well, I That's guess right. You are. That's right. So, That's right. All right. So, so, then, so then, Ernie, you, you go... I'm kind of following your background, right? You go mm -hmm. commit the cardinal sin. You go from an entrepreneur that's doing well. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say it, although I know you didn't do it. Then you go sell mm -hmm. your soul to Maverick, uh -huh. <laughs> right? You go work for yeah. one of your clients, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that doesn't happen too often. No, it happened in uh, it was 2010. So uh, 2008 was a major recession. And in the yeah. creative industry and in marketing industry, there's usually kind of a lag behind. So we really started feeling it in late 2009, early 2010. I had to let go of a few people. Man, the company morale was low. There were clients that were not paying us because uh, they, they're running out of money. And so I'm like, what are we going to do? And one of our biggest clients was a company called Maverick. They're a convenience store chain located in the mountain West. And at the time they had like 170 stores. So it was a good sized business. Mm -hmm. And um, we had been doing all of their branding, tons of their marketing materials and their marketing director decided to uh, leave and go work for a 7-Eleven franchise. And I was, I was terrified that they would hire a another marketing director that had relationships already with somebody else mm -hmm. and we would be left behind. So I called up the owner of the company that had hired me in the first place. And I said, Hey, look, I'd, I'd be very interested in being your marketing director, but you would need to let me keep my company because there's employees there that I need to like, take care of. And we negotiated this great deal where I'd still own the company and Maverick would continue to pay for services that my company provided. And then I would be on salary as their marketing director. Mm -hmm. But three days later, my first, after my first day of work, my company imploded. Uh, my, uh, my employees told all of our clients that I had left and that I was folding up shop. And so they spun off three different businesses, an animation studio, another design studio, and a couple freelancers. And that was sad for me to see my company kind of dissolve away. But really, I needed to, I wanted to create um, a, a new paradigm in the company where they didn't, where my salary was not so needed to be supported by the business. Right. And I'm like, man, this will be easy. You guys, I've got this perfect client set up. I'm in charge of this new client. The company doesn't have to pay for my salary anymore. Man, we are set up. But I didn't, I totally underestimated the influence that I had on a day-to-day -day basis in my own organization, I had, I totally underestimated it. Yeah. It's like you, you gave birth and then you left the kid and you disappeared. And yeah. Was, and yeah, you know, cause again, we'll talk about, we're, we're getting towards branding, but as, mm -hmm. as an owner, as an entrepreneur, which this podcast is about and marketing, mm -hmm. um, you, you're the leader, you're the visionary, you're yeah. the drive force. And, and so, uh, I, I mean, I can relate to them freaking out a bit. Yeah. Uh, and so I, but I, I was thinking, you guys are all talented. You guys are all independent. You guys are very creative. I had a, my, um, 
my vice president had been with me for 14 of the 15 years we were in business. And we'd been working with a coach, a business coach for over a year to work on my transition of like, was I going to get out of the business? Was I going to sell it? Was it whatever? But my own business coach that I'd been paying for over a year, he's the one that encouraged my vice president and my senior designer to start their own company. And he was the partner. So, so uh, I tried my best to, 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 to prepare. And yeah. the very thing that I used to prepare for my transition was the thing that like took it out from under me. Yeah, I think, look, I'm just listening, observing them, and, and I feel bad that it happened that way. But I think one thing I would have done differently, mm -hmm. I would have made all of them owners. I would have see, I would you are taken, absolutely right. I would have taken equity and said, okay, I'm leaving, but you guys, are, you have a piece of this company yep. and we'll continue to grow. And yeah. that's it. And so I don't know if the outcome would have been any different, but. I think no, that's but you're right. You're case. absolutely right. And I wish, you know, looking back, my my business advisor would have been able to give me that advice because I was not, you know, it's the only business I'd ever run. I didn't have a lot of experience. I was good at what I did, mm -hmm. but I didn't have perspective. And I think really good businesses now, uh, business leaders have failed multiple times and tried different things. And that richness of experience, they can bring to bear on a new or whatever their venture is. And it becomes highly successful because they have paid the ultimate price. You know, they've, they've yeah. made some major uh, discoveries. So, But, you know, th there's, there's the underlining hidden side of employment where in the dynamics of having a company and employees where you can go out of your way for your employees, literally mm -hmm. out of your way. Mm -hmm. But it, th there's a point where you're still the owner and they're still the employees, even though yes. they're treated really well. Mm -hmm. That doesn't change. But when you change the dynamic and they become, there's an ownership piece to them working there. Mm -hmm. The psyche changes also. Yeah. And I learned that. I mean, I watched this with you know somebody. I don't like the word boss, but somebody I worked for mm -hmm. was absolutely brilliant. And uh, he gave all of us in 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 the management team. Uh, equity in the company and it was a privately held company it was a warrant mm -hmm. said look one day and we completely walked around and, and said look i'm uh, this is an employee-owned company and it was yeah yeah and even though it doesn't mean anything theoretically because it's a piece of paper that you know unless you sell out one day it doesn't nothing's gonna it's not gonna be worth right. anything you're still the, just the act of being gracious and humble and saying mm -hmm. no i can't do this myself you're a piece of and then if you share You're the so wealth, right. and if you share the wealth and you have a profit sharing plan mm -hmm. instead of a stupid end of end of year bonuses carrot kind of thing, then uh it does make a big difference. I mean, money is not the biggest motivator necessarily, but this is the piece that makes a difference. So You're right. What is so looking at at what you do today and and I'm I'm kind of stuck with the Maverick thing. When mm -hmm. did you make the transition to to, to being a branding expert, to going off on your own, being a speaker, yeah. a motivator, getting on stage, having hundreds of people to talk to. How did yeah. that happen? So uh, when I was um, about three years into my uh, role as the executive director of marketing for Maverick, I learned that the national, I guess the, 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 the industry, the convenience store industry across the country they recognized Maverick as a very, very strong brand. I didn't know that because I was a, I was a creative studio owner. I wasn't in the convenience store business. I was in the marketing business, branding business. And while in the in the industry, um, when they found out when you know uh, executives and leaders in the industry uh, associations like there's a national association of convenience stores and mm -hmm. there are local chapters. You know, the Georgia Association of Convenience Stores, the Florida Association of Convenience Stores, right? The National Association of Convenience Stores invited me to be on their national board for content development for their annual um, uh, content or, or training. So marketing people in the convenience store world would go to NAX, this association, each year, and there would be a curriculum for marketing people. And so me and three other guys three other people, not all women, not all guys, but a couple of women too. We were in charge of developing the content for that, that uh, uh, event. 
And so there'd be like seven or eight classes. Well, I was asked, Ernie, you should share how you'd built the Maverick brand. And I'm like, okay. So I put together a presentation. I worked like crazy on it. I kind of reverse engineered the process. I spent a lot of time on it. And uh, out of 96 presentations that uh, year, mine was rated the best presentation. And so like do they, every presentation gets evaluated by all the audience members. And a lot of people says, Ernie, you should do this professionally. You're a really good presenter. And I'm like, well, okay. Uh, I didn't think much of it, but I've been, I was invited to speak many times afterwards and um, I really enjoyed it. And then I learned that people can get paid to do that. And so, and people can get paid very well to do it. And at around uh, six years into my tenure, I decided I'm going to write a book because so many people are asking me how I did it with Maverick. So I wrote a book called Your Brand Sucks, uh, How to Ignite a Brand That Doesn't. And mm -hmm. it turned out really, it was the hardest thing I'd ever done, by the way. Writing a book was brutal. But um, after writing the book, um, I kind of felt like Maverick was on, I, I wasn't able to do anything more for mm -hmm. them. I was maintaining instead of developing. And as a someone with hyperactive productivity disorder, I am not okay with status quo. I want to push it. And so I decided it's time for me to leave um, and uh, finish my book and pursue a career consulting and uh, speaking. And so that's what I do now. I consult and help. I help uh, solopreneurs and I help huge companies because the process of developing a brand is exactly the same. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what kind of business you're in. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you're talking about it as though it's, oh, so I got invited and I get get paid to speak. Um, I remember when when I left my my corporate position to do to become a business coach, mm -hmm. um, not really knowing what coaching was about. Uh, as I started to network, everybody said to me, if you want to do well, you got to do three things. You have to speak. You have to network and you have to write a book. Yeah. And if you don't have those three, mostly the speaking and the, and the book, the networking, you can just run around and do your thing. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's a formula for success. So mm -hmm. um, networking was, was not easy. I hated it, but I did it anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the speaking piece, you know, I did what every newbie entrepreneur does. You know, I, Got in touch with every chamber of commerce in my in the towns. I'm on Long Island in New York, so there's mm -hmm. lots of them, and association meetings. And I, and I I got people invited me, and I walk in, and I'm the speaker for breakfast for chamber or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, uh, nothing really came out of it, and I said, okay, so what else? Do I have to write a book. So so I was at that point writing blogs, and I'm I'm I like to write. So I mm -hmm. I said, what am I gonna write? So I took a bunch of two, three years worth of blogs and I put them in categories and I published the book. Oh, good. Um, all right. So, the, you know, the again, it, not knowing anything about book publishing and then this guy that was my publisher, he said, oh, you're going to do this and you're going to be invited. He didn't do anything. He did uh -huh. nothing. <laughs> zero. Um, but so I, I get it. My my last book, and I'm not going to talk about my book because I I'm very careful not to self-promote. Mm -hmm. I actually did it the right way, wrote something that I felt was impactful for my readership, just like yours is about branding, studied the whole marketing of self-published universe, mm -hmm. uh, found out and realized that I'm not going to go bankrupt on spending money on Amazon mm -hmm. to get my book to be number one because it's never going to happen. And I know right. who's my, the number one guy I wanted to throw out who's everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't mention your name just to, to be professional. Uh, he's got 4,000 five-star reviews and it's about marketing. And I read his mm -hmm. book and, and, and I could do better, but his book was a lead magnet to sell mm -hmm. his coaching and, and, and courses. Yeah. Not my thing. My book was about, look, I want you to know the things that you're missing yeah. as a business owner, right? To share yeah. with you. I'm not, there's nothing there for you to buy and I'm giving stuff away. So I, I get that piece. The writing the yeah. book was took me two years. Mm -hmm. Um the piece that's interesting about your title is the title of my book, the one I wanted to use was Marketing Mistakes. Mm -hmm. And 
I think it was my son that said to me, Dad, it's too negative. You you should mm -hmm. write, you should have a title that's positive. And I said, I'm not that kind of a guy. I speak the way I speak. Uh -huh. and, and and I do, those are marketing mistakes that are being made by business owners, companies mm -hmm. of all sizes. And no one will tell them that because the agencies and the coaches are not going to reveal the stuff. They sell them the shiny yeah. object, right? And but you know, I thought about it, thought about it, and if, at, at the end, I said, "Okay, fine, I'll I'll change the title to, you know, how to get the most out of marketing, which is which is a pain point for my readers because all mm -hmm. of them spend a fortune and don't get it, but it's also yeah. positive kind of. And interestingly, yeah. the guy that wrote, uh, the art of not giving an F, uh -huh. you know, right? Yep, yep. He, and I I actually heard an interview with him on a podcast. And nobody wanted to, no publisher wanted to actually own it because because mm -hmm. of the F word, right? Yeah. A phenomenally successful guy. He's actually yep. brilliant. I forgot his yep. background. So when you're saying your brand sucks, uh, it's sort of like along the same line, right? It, but, exactly the same lines because I was seeing the same success of other people that were uh, provocative. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, and one of the things I found out in branding is that you, if you are not, the number one thing in branding is you absolutely have to get attention. You will, if you don't get attention, you are not even in the consideration set. So, right. you, and you cannot do that in a safe way. So, so um, let's, let's pause for a second. I want to dive yeah. into branding and then we'll pick this up. Okay. Um, doesn't mean anything, but up until, I mean, about a year plus ago, I was a, a, a professor of marketing in a graduate school of business in New York City company, okay. in a university called Tour University. Doesn't make me smart anybody else, but I taught graduate level MBA courses on marketing. Awesome. I don't, I, so I know some. Was it fun? It was it fun? It was. Yeah. I absolutely loved. It. Oh, that loved sounds teaching. awesome. And you should do it. It's an incredible. Oh, I would love to. I would. Love and it. and look, the MBA students are mostly working adults who are in the business. They're either managerial, executive, or not. Some college grads that go into the MBA program, but it. It's phenomenal because I, I, you know, I'm somewhat a disruptor. It was an opportunity to actually not let them follow the herd and get slaughtered, mm -hmm. but to actually mm -hmm. give them a, a good, a good injection of reality into into the universe of marketing and business in general. So it was marketing, entrepreneurship, leadership. Um, I taught a side course, which was not a curriculum that you're gonna love. I called it self marketing, which was your own personal brand, which we can talk about. Yeah. Um, but here's my thing. Well, all the years I've been doing marketing, and so I was a teacher, okay? Branding to me is one of the, not one, is the most misunderstood concept mm -hmm. in marketing. Most people get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And what they think about a brand is the graphical representation of your logo, your colors, whatever is yeah. the name, which is important, clearly. But that's not your brand. And right. the best definition that I've always used, and I think it's I think it's Seth Godin, um, who I happen to know and love and follow him mm -hmm. for 30 years. He's mm -hmm. been I'm like a groupie. Uh -huh. uh, I think his definition is your brand is the promise that you make to people who want to do business with you, right? Or mm -hmm. the people you seek to serve. That's like a, a Seth Godin term. So it's okay. the promise that you make to the people you seek to serve, i.e. If you want to buy from me, here's a promise. Yeah. Um, unpack that. Do you agree? It's, disagree? Well, yeah. There's well, there's there's a. I'll unpack that a little bit. The promise that is the real promise, not the voice of the business promise, hmm. because there are so many times when those things are not congruent. Like the company will say, "This is our brand," but they are not true to their brand. Mm -hmm. For example, their voice and language might be okay. We are, um, we're, we are generous and giving and loving, yet they treat their employees like garbage. Okay. Or, or we stand behind our products and the first customer service call, somebody's reading a script and say to you, go F yourself. Who cares? Right. Right. So, so that, that is the, the, when you say, Hey, it's the brand promise. Like, well, the promise could be something that's advertised or promoted, but is not realized. So the brand then becomes uh, delusional. You say you're one thing, but you're actually something else. So what I think the brand is, the brand is the overall um, message 
and the feeling that's associated with the product or company. And that is defined intentionally at first. There is a design for it. That's a brand strategy. Now, how well they execute the brand strategy is the end result of the brand. The brand strategy is not the brand. That is the intent. And so we've got to do everything we can in this brand strategy to implement or convey to the minds and hearts of our audience of who we are and what we stand for and why they would like, we, we do business with businesses that we like. It's not about this mathematical equation of features and benefits that I get over and over. Well, what we need to do in our marketing messages is explain the features and benefits. Okay. If you do that without personality, you are forgotten. What personality? And that personality is the brand. The marketing is the message. The brand is how is it pre represented? In, is, it in a, is it presented in a way that gets me enthused, curious, excited? Like how, how am I supposed to feel about your company? Right. Um, and that yeah, needs so to be, first of all, intentionally designed. And then it needs to be fastidiously executed. And I think you said something that that's it's critical, and it's a word that I learned it eleven years ago during coaching training. But it, it, the world was congruent, right? Mm -hmm. the The congruency. I'm in New York. It's been. And I like simple stuff. Congruency means walk the walk, talk the talk, right? Absolutely. If you're gonna say, if you're gonna say something, but then in reality, the way your company behaves, the way your product function, the way your service is delivered. Mm -hmm is opposite of what, you, what I just saw on your website. We'll take that as an example. Yeah. Then, nah. so, you, so I think what you're saying uh, is that it, not the promise that you make, but the brand is how it makes me feel mm -hmm. when I come across it. It could be a mm -hmm. logo and it could be an interaction, but how do I feel? So I know what my answer is, but what? who is your, if you're at the point to one company, that you say is executing flawlessly on branding, who would that be? Right now, I would say Liquid Death. Okay, I, and I've never heard of them. So okay. I'm, I'm, I must Liquid Death, a that's okay. Liquid Death is a can of water. It's just water. They have a new you know, product that's a sparkling brand and there's now flavored water, but it is water. But they promote it and market it as if it were some kind of poison. It's called liquid death. The can, the on the on the bottom of each can, it says murder your thirst. There's skulls. There is um, they have uh, they did a tase test where people were asked to choose what their their water, their favorite water was, and they were tased, not a taste test, a tase test. They have a horror scope where you can subscribe to be told how you would die each month. Okay. They are all in with this whole macabre brand on a product that is actually healthy for you. That's good for you. And they bottle it or they, they package it in aluminum cans, which is healthier than all the plastic bottles. So you have all these bottled water brands saying, hey, we're healthy and life water and stuff like that. Yet they use plastic that's killing the earth and is toxic for you and me. And yet there's a brand that's called Liquid Death that's promoting this deathy, angsty brand in the healthiest way possible. That's what I think. A brand that is fully saturated in an image and look, feel, tone, and personality uh, that is consistently executed. So, you know, as you're as you're describing it, I'm mm -hmm. I, I I mean emotionally, I was I I was feeling uncomfortable. Uh -huh. Like it was it was rattling me up. But talking about liquid <laughs> totally. death and horoscope and this is how you're gonna die. Yes. And look, but we're marketing people. So obviously this is not for everyone, right? This it is, is not. not. Absolutely not. not. Yeah, this is not for the person that's going to get a bottle of Perrier, put it in a cup and hold his pinky and drink. Right. It. This right. is, so they, they're clearly define their target audience. Yep. I, I don't want to say the first target audience that came to my mind because it's going to sound too political. And I don't want to uh -huh. say it. But it has It's energy do... drinkers. It's energy drinkers. 
because it's, it's, it's angsty. It's like, in fact, the idea behind the brand, this kind of this, uh, aggressive brand came at a monster, uh, energy sponsored event where the founder of liquid death was seeing all these athletes drinking. I think it's called studio monster studio water. It's basically water in a monster energy can because not all athletes drink energy drinks, which are really bad for you. Uh, it, this is why real athletes don't drink them. Right. But they, uh, and so he was watching this, this interesting uh, experience here. And he's like, well, they're drinking the water because it's really cool. Why, why don't we have a water brand out there that is super attractive to this audience? Let's make one. So he created a brand that is highly um, attractive to an energy drinker consumer because really people aren't buying, people buy water because they're thirsty, but they're buying brands of water because they want to tell people about themselves. And so mm. they choose this water because I want people to think I am this type of person. I drink yeah. Perrier, you know, because I yeah. want, I'm, there's different sparkling water. You can get like generic sparkling water and save money, but you get Perrier because eh, it's probably got a tiny bit of a different uh, flavor profile. There's yeah, more it's, minerals it's, in it, but it's an image statement. And, mm -hmm. and you know, when we go to a restaurant in New York, okay, would you like uh, tap water or would you like uh, Pellegrino or Buddha? Is it, no, it's yeah. New York tap water is fine, but yeah. some people, would want that Pellegrino or whatever it is to to right. Perry has sit on their desk. What mm -hmm. they don't know is that it's probably it's probably been the water is New York City water that goes through some filtering <laughs> and they slap they slap a label on it and okay if it right. makes you feel great, right? Uh, that's wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. So speaking of water, mm -hmm. you help Chuck Norris, yeah, uh, with his bottled water called Sea Force, right? Right. So I guess first question is, look, my audience are, I think, different age groups, but I think a lot of right. them are uh, probably the, the I'm Seasoned? guessing 30, 30 to 50, okay. maybe. Okay, yeah. 40s, okay. these are entrepreneurial, uh, whatever. Yeah. And I don't even know if they know Chuck Norris. I know Chuck Norris. Mm -hmm. Chuck Norris helped me tremendously with my de-stressing by watching his movie. <laughs> right. Until, <laughs> until Steven Seagal showed up and... Uh, yeah. What's the French the French guy? I forgot his name. Jean Claude Van Damme. Yeah, Jean Claude, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so how did you meet Chuck Norris? And and uh, so I read the stuff that the stuff is actually bottled on his ranch. Yeah, it right? is. Yeah. How'd you meet him? And how'd you get so, into this? Crazy! It is the craziest thing. Um, we uh we were brainstorm my my uh, creative department at Maverick was brainstorming ideas for a giant annual sweepstakes prize that would influence our target customers of 18 to 45 year old men who work out of a truck, like landscapers, contractors, mm -hmm. things like that. The, these people buy a lot of gas and they are not calorie conscious. So they buy a lot of product at Maverick. So we wanted to come up with a sweepstakes prize that was so exciting and so cool that it would get these this target audience to join our loyalty program and then use their rewards on entries to win. And so one of the ideas we came up with was, what if we had the Diesel Brothers? They are on the Discovery Channel. They build crazy, outrageous vehicles. What if we got them to build a work truck that was the ultimate work truck? And then someone said, what if we called it Truck Norris? We all were crazy about the idea. And then this little voice inside my head said, oh, dude, you're going to get sued. You are going to, if you do this, you're going to get sued. You got to get his permission. I call that little voice the dream killer, by the way. I'm as an entrepreneur, I think most people have like a little dream killer in their head that says, Don't do that. Don't do that. Right. So you have to tame that dream killer. Anyway. So I decided to like, we're gonna just we're gonna go for it. So after about after months of like dead ends and wrong turns, we finally meet the agent. And the agent said no. And we're like, but I'm like, well, at least I tried. Well, right, because like three weeks later, I get a call from Gina Norris, who wants to know more about the Truck Norris campaign. And man, my hands started sweating. My mouth was all dry. And I choked out the worst 
pitch of my career, but she said, we're in. And here's what happened. She said, um, Carlos and I, oh, by the way, Chuck Norris's real name is Carlos. I didn't know that. Really? Yeah. Wow. So Carlos and I discovered water, a pure source of water on our ranch. See, they were drilling for an irrigation source to irrigate their fields in Navasota, Texas. But the water was super pure. So they had it tested. And the hydrologist that tested said, hey, look, this is exceptionally pure. This is like high grade water. You could, this is the kind of water you could sell. And so Gina and Carlos decided that they would, they would build a water bottling plant across the street from the house in Navasota and start bottling and selling water because they wanted to raise money for their Kickstart Kids charity that they're heavily involved with. You know, when, when Carlos passes away, what's going to fund their charity? And so that's, that was their plan. They didn't have any retailers lined up to sell their water. So they said, look, if you give us permission, I mean, if you sell our water in your stores, we'll give you permission to use the Truck Norris uh, name. And we'll also let you, uh, well, Chuck Norris will be available for your marketing materials, like videos or photos and stuff. And so I'm like, done. And then I was able to, uh, we went down, my production crew, crew and I, I uh, went down to Navasota, Texas and filmed a bunch of videos and, you know, I, and I, it was like a dream come true for me because Chuck Norris was one of my childhood heroes. I mean, everybody, I knew who Chuck Norris was because I saw him fight Bruce Lee, you know, in one of his movies and like, he was the ultimate like underdog. And I, as a kid, I was like a scrawny kid. So I was an underdog and I'm like, hero, this hero. And so after producing these, uh, shooting these videos, he said, Ernie, you want to work out with me today? And I'm like, work out with Chuck Norris? Are you kidding? So we worked out together. And then he invited me to dinner at the, their home, their ranch home. So me and my production crew are eating dinner, meatloaf and mashed potatoes at Chuck Norris's house. And he, he, at the end of dinner, he turns to me and he goes, well, Ernie, what do you want to do now? I'm sitting right next to him. And I look at him with these anime eyes filled with like, hero worship and and i said carlos could we watch a chuck norris movie together and he's like let's do it so we watch we're in his home theater room watching a chuck norris movie together and i'm eating apple pie dessert and i'm within hand holding distance of like my childhood hero and he is like the sweetest kindest old conservative he's super conservative highly christian religious very sweet so he's Definitely not the character he plays mm. in the movies, but that was my experience. That's how I got to know Carlos. I, I watched the the animation on the water itself, and mm -hmm. I mean, stuff's great. All the minerals mm -hmm. that are yeah are caught there, right? Yeah, and um, but, but their brand at first, their brand available? at first was uh, uh yeah, it's available. But the brand at first was all about um purity. Yeah. And they weren't selling much water. And, and the deal was we could do this promotional campaign with, with the Norrises if we were selling their water. And our water, our, our, our packaged Bev sales uh, agent was going, it's not selling. We're going to have to pull it. And I'm going, so I'm talking to the Norrises and saying, you've got to find a way to sell this water better. So let's do some billboards. Let's do some marketing and promote it. Well, all their marketing messages were about purity. I'm like, you are on your, your brand is not about purity. Even though your hydrologist said it was like the purest water, a hydrologist is not a marketing expert. So let's come up with something different. And so I sat down with them and we worked through our, the, my process. And it was, it's pretty obvious. Like the biggest point of difference in their water and anybody else's is that it's Chuck Norris's ranch. So we need to promote Chuck Norris on the packaging, on the branding and stuff. And so that's what we did. We ended up putting Chuck Norris, like life-size illustrations of Chuck Norris holding water in a, a, a display in a store. So you'd walk up and you'd see Chuck Norris there and he's holding two bottles of water as if they were machine pistols, you know? And it's like, oh, I'm going to try this water because it's Chuck Norris water. And a lot of brands get it wrong because they think, they think about features and benefits of the product instead of the personality of the company the image of the company. Yeah. And, and I see that a lot through my, my business coaching. And I'm so you've seen it through the agency work and even what you do now is that 
especially with startups, you yeah. know, they would spend uh, an ungodly amount of money on the name. Fine. The name's important. Yeah. You know? yeah. Although the word Google means nothing. Right. Right. But, right. They'll, they, you know, the, the, the absolute perfect name, the absolute perfect illustration, graphic colors, mm -hmm. uh, ungodly amount of money. Yeah. But they spend very little about the stuff that about the things that you talk about, which yeah. is your the the soul of the company. Who mm -hmm. are you? What do you want yeah. to be known for? What do you represent? How do people actually connect with you as a company? We 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 keep forgetting, and it's like my thing about marketing and psychology is that regardless of what we do in marketing and whatever direction we touch. It doesn't matter what we call it. It doesn't matter if it's a product or a service or a company or a brand. Yeah. There's a human being behind there. And mm -hmm. if it's a, if there's a human being who's making a decision to buy from you or engage you, it's 100% emotional. Mm -hmm. And if you get that, the features don't mean anything. The benefit mm -hmm. is all the emotions. But then, okay, so why me, right? This is the old, the old is like, yeah. why me? And you know how many people when and and I'm I'm part of an international mentoring platform called Growth Mentor, and I'm literally wake up and and mentor for free startup founders and executives and owners around the world. And the first question I ask them all the time, and I'm serious, and he said, Tell me as a business owner or as a SaaS company, whatever you are, what problem are you solving? They can't answer it. They'll, they'll dive right into the features and why they're great and why they yeah. didn't say, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what problem are you solving? What person out there in the universe is frustrated by something that he doesn't have or she doesn't have a solution for? Yeah. And you're it, but not just yeah. you're it, but why is that different and better yeah. than what they have today? Because in most, in, in almost all cases, our biggest competitor to whatever we do is not another company. It's the existing behavior of the of the uh, potential customer mm. who are fixing their problems their, their way without dealing with anybody else's product. So that's mm. behavior modification. How do I go to Ernie mm -hmm. and ask him to not fix this his way, but actually use my way? Yeah. They miss it. They spend all this money on, on the bells and whistles and the shiny objects and all the other stuff, and they forget as a human being. I call that humanizing the marketing process. Yeah, and we keep I, we keep forgetting this. You know? Yeah, I wonder if um, like I've been in marketing classes, and I think one of the things I find is that uh, if you have a marketing professor who is an intellectual, an intellectual highly values their own ability to think through things mm -hmm. and be right because they're smart. They don't want to confess that they are emotionally based creatures. Mm -hmm. And so if they start teaching that we, most of our decisions are based on emotion, then that undermines their intellect. And I think that's why we're getting, we're getting it wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and again, you escape the corporate entity, but what happens is, and it still happens today, you know, people don't take risks. Right. Mm -hmm. Everybody chooses the safe option, especially if you work yeah. for someone. Now, how many people do we know that are brave and disruptors and came up with some crazy idea like Chuck Norris water? Right. Which nobody would say, what do you mean water? The guy's a martial arts guy. He's, he's yeah. he had an infomercial about the, I think, what is it called? The gym, something gym, right? Yeah. The total yep, gym. The total gym. He's is, got right? four of those, by the way. And yeah. he knows how to use them. I mean, <laughs> Uh, we're always looking for uh, the, the, nobody wants to disrupt very few people yeah. disrupt but those that do make a really long-term huge impact as if i'd love to get your reaction on this idea yeah okay. uh, do you watch a basketball at all like nba i, I don't watch it religiously okay. i would watch it once in a while i can tell you why i hate basketball if you want in in a one minute sentence my tell son <laughs> loved my son loved basketball and when he was in middle school, and I'm not, I'm not kidding. Every day when he finishes homework, he would go outside in in a driveway where he had a, mm -hmm. a basket and and literally practice for three hours so that he can make the school team. Yeah. Every day, no, no exceptions. 
he was driven three, three point shots drilling mm -hmm. dribbling he was phenomenal and, and he played in tremules on a local club team everybody knew him he was great mm -hmm. then tryouts come out and there were two spots open now one spot is open right and the coach picks another guy and everybody says why wasn't Elon picked mm -hmm. and we knew why he picked the other guy because the other the other guy his father was on the board of education He Politics. crushed my son, Ernie. He crushed yeah. him. And I'm talking yeah. about a year of dedication. Yeah. And he, he was very, really good. Yeah. Right? He crushed yeah. him. And he came home. Oh. And he said, I don't know why. And, and I said to him, I want you to go to your teacher, sit in front of him and ask him, look him in the eye and ask him the question. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you pick me? Because I'm that guy couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah. It was a joke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you pick me? At least look me in the eye. Yeah. You know what he said then? What? Sometimes you have to make decisions that are not always the right decision, but you still have to make them. Oh, right? man. So what a great lesson he, to teach a kid. When he came home, Ernie, I, I'm a writer. I wrote this guy a letter and I ripped him to shreds. Yeah. And the essence of what I wrote to him was, you are a teacher, you stupid moron. Your job mm -hmm. is to to lead, to teach, to yeah. educate. And you just taught my son a lesson that politics is more important than principles, yeah. right? Than doing the right thing. Yeah. You're an ass. Yeah. You're an ass. Way I to go, I teacher. What? Way to go, teacher. Yeah, this way is, to go, it, teacher. Way to Now, go. Lo you know, looking back, things happened for a reason. Mm -hmm. he, he did not touch a basketball again. Started to play saxophone. And was discovered as a as as an incredibly talented musician. You know, um, I think a lot. I'm I'm I appreciate you telling me that story because your listeners, as entrepreneurs, we are all highly driven, highly motivated, goal oriented, and oftentimes the efforts that we put in uh, or the the outcomes are not what we want. Mm -hmm. We we prefer other outcomes, and um, I suffered. From a lot for a very very long time of feelings of overwhelming failure, because the outcomes of all of my efforts were not being realized, and I came to the conclusion that I was destined that God wanted me to be a failure, mm -hmm. and I was extremely depressed, extremely depressed. I was like, you know what? Why even try? And you you played the opening music to a TV production, a series I did. I've done so many things and I look back and I thought, man, these are failures, failures, failures. And um, I got to a point that I was so depressed that one of my colleagues, who's now a vice president at Maverick, the store I used to work for, he asked me what was wrong. And I basically projectile vomited all of my failures all over him. And after, you know, all these different failures, like the Iron Man I ran, took me 16 hours instead of the 14 that I wanted. I mean, all these things that I had done, he looked at me like, dude, you get credit for trying. I mean, all these things you did are actually pretty good yeah. successes, right? But what, what the reason I want to share this is that he, what he said to me kind of changed my mind. I, he, he said, Ernie, you get credit for trying. But what I understood was that trying is success, not the outcomes. Right. Because if we only measured success by the outcomes, most of our lives would be lived in an unsuccessful state. And that, that is atrocious. But if we, if we measured success by the effort, then like your son, you could tell him, dude, you crushed it. You were out there every day heading toward your goal. And you can call that a success. Whether or not you made the team, that's irrelevant. Irrelevant. Because what you've proven to yourself is that you have this, the aggressive uh, tenacity to go after any goal you want, that is success. Now, if we read, like if, if all the entrepreneurs in the world said, hmm, it's, it's more important that I consistently execute on my plan, the best plan I can come up with, than it is to fail at the end and give up. I would much rather people go, man, I'm gonna crush it. I'm gonna crush the plan and I'm gonna celebrate crushing the plan. And if it doesn't meet my objective, Don't worry, I'll just go back and create a new plan. Crush the new plan and then celebrate. I mean, eventually, whatever goal we have would be inevitable. We would reach it. Mm -hmm.
So that's yeah. like, as an entrepreneur, I highly identify with that type of person. And I'm, I just hope that uh, your listeners would go, man, you're right. It, if I just put a plan together and I, I reach for the stars and I just go after it, whether or not I reach, you know, hit the stars or not, I might hit the moon. So, so here's why, here's why it's, I, I think this message is so critical today because we have a generation of, I call them lazypreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the younger generations that are going and in, getting into business and they they think that success is measured by pressing the button on your mm -hmm. phone or the it's easy. key. Uh, you know, it's just, and, and being a digital native and knowing how to use all the platforms and the technology, they don't know how to, they don't know how to problem solve. They don't know how to be creative. They don't know. Okay. So, so the lights went out. What do we do now? Well, I guess we do nothing because we don't have internet. No, you have a pen and a piece of paper. You could still be productive and do something. I, I, I worry for their sake because it's a generation that is growing into, they don't know the kind of hard work that you and I know. Yeah. That you yeah. try, you fail, you try, you fail, you keep trying, you keep trying, or you walk away from a great job and take the risk of being an entrepreneur. You think you're going to be okay, but then you get slapped in, slapped out, and, and it's nonstop. Look, I mm -hmm. look at entrepreneurship as that that old English general that, was conquering some island and took all the boats, you know, all the soldiers, and then they land on the island. The first thing that he did burn was the burn the boats, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, if you don't have that, it, look, I've I've gone through this. I walked away from a six-figure, really, really good corporate position in a worse time anybody should go and become an entrepreneur when I put my third year, my third child through college and I was done. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now I can just sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. No yeah. more financial obligations. <laughs> I walked out and it took me 18 grueling months to find, to yeah. figure it out. Did I have the little voices that said, you can always go back and get a job if mm -hmm. it doesn't work? Yeah, many times. Mm -hmm. And I slapped myself and I said, no, that's a coward way of thinking. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I made the move and in the mid fifties, when you make that move, believe me, there is no... I could get a job, but I wasn't going to mm -hmm. get a job getting paid six figures. Right. 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 They replaced me with three people already making half. Yeah. So that, that wasn't it. So it's just grinding it out and, and, and staying awake at night and getting up in the morning, but, and then not allowing yourself to consider anything other than no, I'm going to make it work. Yeah. And, and it, it did take 18, 20 months for me yeah. to figure this out. Uh, it's 11 years later and, and it was great, but mm -hmm. it certainly wasn't easy, but you wanted to ask me something about basketball and then we're going to jump. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, so the basketball thing is like, cause we were talking about like features and benefits, like, uh, talking about, you know, our, our cool features. That's our marketing plan is about yeah. marketing strategy. And I, I was talking to a group of, uh, of people online and I made this, uh, this comparison. I said in the basketball world the N the uh, NBA, if all of those brands promoted their, their, um, uh, their product, you would call them the New York basketballers. And they, they would talk about their stats, their winning stats. Mm -hmm. um, the colors they would use would be determined by the basketball sport, orange, black. This is, these are things that you would normally associate with basketball. So when people think of the New York basketballers, they would think basketball because those are the right colors. Well, the Los Angeles basketballers would say, well, we're a better basketball team. You should follow us because our stats, our players are able to have this many more rebounds, this many more free throw accuracy, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Our history of this, a history of that. Then you have the Utah basketballers. Okay. What? And that's, that's exactly what most industries are doing. They're saying, let me tell you about my product in my industry. Yet, what do the new, what do the Knicks have to do with basketball? What do the Lakers have to, the Spurs, the Jazz? They have nothing to do with basketball, but those are the brands. Mm -hmm. They create a visual story that is highly different from all of their competitors. It it's what creates raving fans. You know, mm -hmm. I want to be a Laker fan, and the Laker brand 
is influenced by the players, of course, but those players change. And the brand wants to attract celebrity level players. That's the brand. You want, you know, the, the Michael Jordans, you know, that's the Chicago Bulls. They want the biggest, baddest players they can get, right? But those players come and go. The Bulls have nothing to do with basketball. Mm -hmm. So why do we as marketing people go, I want to talk so much about my features and benefits and my brand is about that. What does Apple, the computer company, have to do with apples or fruit? Yeah, I, I saw your video on that. That was that's pretty. And the, the banana computer company. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine um, if we call the banana computer company, we all say that's ridiculous, but nobody's having a problem with the Apple computer company. No, but but again, what we also have to recognize that to get that type of a brand loyalty mm -hmm. takes time. Yep. It takes time. Yep. It takes consistency. Of course, the marketing piece comes into play with the branding, the imaging, and the and mm -hmm. the the graphical depiction of what the brand looks like. Yeah, mm -hmm. the Apple with the bite into it is brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, Google, if somebody said to you, I'm going to start a new computer company, call it Google. They said, what is that? Well, it's Google. It's become the Xerox of paper copying. I'm right. going to Google it, right? I mean, it takes forever to do it, but they're smart because if you look at the Google brand, when you open up your browser, mm -hmm. every day there's a new thing going on. It's mm -hmm. They're keeping you engaged. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So oh, I have sure. one question and we go to rapid fire. You bet. You bet. One, if you had to give somebody only one advice on branding that is going to be a life changing life as in personal mm -hmm. or business, what would you tell them? What is your desired customer reaction? In other words, how do you want people to react or feel when mm -hmm. they come across your brand? Right. Because if you know the answer to that, then you can engineer an experience that will elicit that reaction. Yeah. And, and of course, the, the underside of what you're saying is you have to put in the work mm -hmm. to get to know them first. Yep. It's not a guessing game. You got to go. You got to go talk to them. I've learned my success in business was not because I'm smart than anybody else. It's because I had an intuitive sense from an early time when I was in marketing to be on the road. I used to ride with salespeople in the car and go on sales calls mm -hmm. so okay. I can observe I can observe them in action how they sell the company or the, the whatever it was and but more interestingly watch the customer's reaction to the presentation the type of questions I went to hundreds of trade shows all over mm -hmm. the world I was in the medical industry most of my career stand in a booth for hours at a time right and but you get to talk to real people right of course, the dog was so quiet up until now. Um, so, all right, let's do rapid fire. Okay, good. Uh, one person that influenced you the most. Oh my gosh, I think it was um, Tim Ferriss and his oh, in his four book, hour week. Yep. the Four Hour Work Week. It was yeah. mind changing. Best advice you ever received. Um, best advice: uh, keep trying. Keep trying. It. It's yeah. Just keep it's trying. If if you had a a billboard in Times Square, what would you put on it? You can cheat and, and yeah, and, I'm gonna say success it. is the effort. Got it. Apropos our conversation about my son and yeah. training three hours a day to, to yep. make a team and now making a team. Um well <laughs> Okay, so I I sent you the now I understand how you how you found it. I sent you the rapid fire and the last one was actually for my last guest. Oh who yeah, was give, <laughs> who was giving Paul McCartney and Steve Tyler tours in Chile. Uh huh. Uh, so you didn't do that piece, but oh, yeah. what song would you admit to secretly singing in the shower? Uh, if you want my body and you think I'm sexy, that's oh, the one. <laughs> Uh, and and your wife, the supermodel, says, "Yeah, keep dreaming, Ernie. That used to be the days. That's okay." If you she says you, she's really nice, and she yells over the shower, "Yes, yes, you're sexy. Is that what you want to hear?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you sing it, it'll happen. Okay. Right, That's right. Fine. You're awesome, right. Ernie. This was awesome. Thank you so much for making time for me. My pleasure. Um, this, this unknown podcaster that nobody's heard about, but you know, it's changing. It's mm -hmm. I committed to 
as a marketing guy, not spending one cent on promoting my podcast. I want right. it to grow organically. Mm -hmm. uh, well, people talking about it and it's beginning to happen. People are reaching mm -hmm. out and saying, can I be a guest? Uh, I love it. And, and it's working. And I'm not picky. I'm not asking how many followers you are. Somebody yeah. actually asked me that the other day. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody who's a pretty heavy hitter person, right? Their mm -hmm. agent. And I said, wow, what does it matter? Yeah. Do you want to play the typical top 10 podcasters? They only bring in people with mega followers so you can combine the numbers and you can expose each other to 50, 100,000 people. Yeah. Do you want to play that game? Or do you want an interesting one-hour conversation where people actually walk away and say, holy crap, I learned something. Oh, it yeah. made a difference for me. So You know what's interesting said, too is that um, like – I'm, I admire your your um, plan that you are committed to doing this episode and not doing like these these series and not doing a promotion like a you're not self promoting because we no. are so especially the entrepreneurs we are so burned out of people selling us crap that no. if I can listen to a podcast where I know I am not going to get pitched it's like a breath of fresh air and I'm also going to see like authenticity that is in this pre-packaged world of Instagram and LinkedIn personas, you know, sales personas, it is so nice to be able to go, I can sit down and relax and know I'm not going to get pitched to, and I'll probably get some insight that wasn't canned. Yeah. And, and look, I'm a, I'm a Seth Godin groupie, right? I know the man I fought him for 30, 30 years and he'll, one of his book was ideas that spread. Right. And, mm -hmm. and he will tell you that the best marketing is that people begin to talk about you. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with, with email marketing and social. Mm -hmm. No, people just talk about something that they heard or saw. Uber mm -hmm. spread like wildfire without spending a penny on marketing. Why? Because everybody said, holy crap, this is a new thing. Look mm -hmm. at this. We can do this. So, yeah. look, for me, I look, I enjoy this tremendously. Me too. And for me, if someone walks away with one nugget, Mm -hmm. that's going to open up a door for them or get them to think differently, then then I've succeeded. And somebody said to me, 60-minute podcast? You know, dude, that's a lot of time. You know what I said? They don't listen. I'm not right. I'm not for everybody, okay? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I listen to podcasts all day long. They're all one hour. The one that, if you haven't run into it, it's called The Knowledge Project, mm -hmm. a podcast by um, the Fernham Group, Shane. Phenomenal, an hour and 20 minute, but deep dive into amazing, yeah. an amazing concept. Mm -hmm. I don't listen mm -hmm. to it for an hour and 20 minutes. I listen in the car when I go to a train station or I drop my daughter off in the airport. And then if I go for a three mile walk, I listen to it and I stop and I play. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. I value it. You know, it's, it's, it's my time and I choose to do it. You want to get 30 minutes of 20 minutes of mutual admiration society between two famous celebrities five minutes of content and the rest how you can buy shit yeah knock yourself out yeah not, that's not here <laughs> no not here for sure ernie awesome thank you again i know we went way overboard but it's fine uh this was fun i we stay in touch um yeah. anything i can do to help I, i'll take your book and do the thing because thank you we're both we're both authors who are not number one bestsellers. You know? Absolutely you know? not. We, we Absolutely deserve not. a chance. <laughs> That's right, right. Well, you know what? If if success is measured in onesies and twosies, um, I'm grateful to get to know you and and uh, now be I friends with you. So I appreciate you know it. what? Yeah. Success. Success just happened right here. Woohoo! Listen, I, get, I got more out of this one hour with you than I could get of... <laughs> A month long BS networking, yeah. shaking hands with people that just want to sell me something yeah. indirectly or directly. You know what? So this is a good investment of my time. And Mine you know too. what? And the fact that the growth mentor platform that I'm on, I'm I'm mentoring people from all over the world for free. And I'm it it, it absolutely fulfilling my life in the past year that I, in ways I can't imagine. Ten. And somebody asked me, why does it work that way? And I said, because when there is no underlying monetary subliminal or direct reward, right? I don't get paid for my time, right? I do this because I want to help you. Nice. And you don't have to worry about it because I'm not going to charge you for anything. The conversations and the impact that I'm having is life-changing. How do I know? 
look at their reviews. I mean, we mm -hmm. people reviews me, and this is I don't get any benefit out of it, right? Mm -hmm. But in less than a year, I broke a hundred reviews and became one of the top seven mentors worldwide. As awesome. less than a year, <laughs> why? Not because I'm great, because I love it, and yeah. the impact works. So awesome. you're right. It's it, it, not everything's about transaction. You know, mm -hmm. it's time for that. So awesome. All right, man. Thanks again. Thanks, it was awesome. Bring See you later, buddy. Bye.